All right, we have two differential equations here with some different initial conditions for each of those. And what we're going to look at is using the existence and uniqueness theorems that we've talked about so far in the first chapter and trying to determine whether each of these differential equations with the specific initial conditions that are given are guaranteed to have a solution or not. And if they are guaranteed to have a solution, whether we know that that solution is going to have to be unique and if possible, on what interval those guarantees hold. All right, so remember that we have two theorems that we've talked about in this first chapter. One that is, in general, for all first order differential equations, and then the other one that is specifically for linear first order differential equations. So anytime you're looking at any problem like this, the first thing you want to think about is, is the differential equation linear or not? And it's important that you pay attention to the variables so you're clear about what is the independent and dependent variable. So you can think about that. So both of these differential equations, the derivative is dy dt. So that's telling you y is the dependent variable and t is the independent variable. And so when you're thinking about whether the differential equation is linear or not, you're often really paying attention to that dependent variable and what is applied to that dependent variable. And in this second differential equation here, you'll notice all of this operations that are applied to my y here. This is a cube root. It's a little bit hard to see there. Cube root of y on the numerator there. That all I have all of this stuff applied to that dependent variable, which makes this one a nonlinear differential equation. So I'm going to use the appropriate theorem for that one that applies to all first order differential equations. This one, however, y being the dependent variable, the only things that are applied to that y are differentiation and multiplication by a function of the independent variable. So this one is linear. So I'm going to use the appropriate theorem for that. I'm going to start with the, the nonlinear differential equation because that's the first theorem that we talked about. We called that theorem 1. And so when I think about the nonlinear differential equation, I want to think about rewriting that so that it's dy dt equals, and then move all of the other variables to the other side of the equation. So I'm going to first do that. And then I'm going to divide through by t times e to the t, or I'm going to multiply through by 1 over t e to the t. And I've kind of separated this a little bit here so that I've got the parts involving y and the parts involving t sort of factored out. Because when you think about the theorem, then the conditions that you want to look at are this function and its partial derivative with respect to y and where that is continuous. All right, so when I think about this right-hand side of the differential equation, I'm thinking about that as my function of t and y. And I want to think about where is this function continuous. So that's a function of two variables. So you need to go to your calculus 3 knowledge, your multivariable function knowledge, and think about continuity of a function of two variables. And so you're really thinking about here, for, th for this particular problem, you're really thinking about where this function is defined. And there are a couple things that should jump out at you as places where this function is going to fail to be defined. Uh, the denominator here uh, includes y plus 1. So it's not continuous when y is equal to negative 1. It's also not continuous when t is equal to 0. This is continuous everywhere else. I have a root here, so we need to be a little careful about that. But it is a cube root which is continuous for all values of input in that cube root here. So this is continuous everywhere except where y is equal to negative 1 and where t is equal to 0. I encourage you to graph that region, in this case in a ty plane, because what you need to think about is whether these points that are given are in the interior of the region where that function is continuous or not. All right, so if this is my ty plane, t equals 0 would be right along here. I'm going to put a dashed line there to indicate that it is not continuous along here. And then y equals negative 1 is another place where it fails to be continuous. So put a negative 1 there and put dashed line there to indicate that that is not included. And then this function is continuous everywhere except along those two lines. So it's continuous 
all throughout this region and this region. Okay, so theorem one talks about existence and uniqueness as two separate parts. So the existence part of the theorem asks where this function is continuous, and the important part is whether your point that's given is in the interior of the region where the function is continuous or not. So that's when the graph is especially helpful. So if you think about this point here, 1, 1, and again, paying attention to your variables and your axes, 1 in the t direction and 1 in the y direction. So for the first one, our point is here, 1, 1, and that is in the interior, in the inside of the region where this function is continuous. So for this first initial condition, I am guaranteed that there is a solution through this point. For this second one here, if you think about this one, y of one equals zero, when t is equal to 1 and y is equal to 0, and I did the wrong point because I wanted it to be on the boundary. No, we're okay. Sorry, you're going to have to snip that out. <laughs> For this second one, if we look at this one, this point, y of 1 equals 0. When we think about x equals 1 and y equals 0, you see that that point is also in the interior of the region. So we are also guaranteed that a solution exists for this initial condition. For theorem one, though, to check uniqueness, remember that there is something else you have to consider to check uniqueness. In order to check uniqueness, you need to look at the partial derivative of this function with respect to the dependent variable, y. So I need to think about the partial derivative of this function with respect to y. So del f del y, where f is this right-hand side here. And the, the reason I pulled that apart a little bit with my t's and my y's was so that I could find this partial derivative easily. So if I'm differentiating with respect to y, all of this factor that involves t will be treated as a constant. So that part will just come along out front. And then here, I'm gonna need to use a little bit of quotient rule. It's kind of an ugly derivative. I'm gonna put my minus sign out front here. Kind of an ugly derivative. I don't need to worry too much about simplifying. What I need to think about, though, is where this partial derivative is continuous. All right, so I'm going to use my quotient rule here. Derivative of the top, 1 third times y to the negative 2 thirds times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, which is just 1, all over the bottom squared. All right, so there's my partial derivative with respect to y, and it's kind of a big mess. But the big deal thing I need to think about here is where this is continuous. And so again, we run into trouble when t is equal to 0. I run into trouble where y is equal to negative 1. Any restrictions you have from here would also be restrictions for where this partial derivative would be continuous. But there's another one that shows up here. I have y to the negative 2 thirds which is 1 over the cube root of y. So for this one, I run into some trouble also where y is equal to 0. So where this is continuous, is I have these two restrictions here, but also I have the restriction where y cannot be 0. This y to the negative 2 thirds means 1 over y to the 2 thirds. So y equals 0 is also a restriction. So I'm going to have my restriction where y is equal to 0, y is equal to negative 1, and x is equal to 0. And so we're continuous on this whole region here. And so I'm looking at this in order to check for the uniqueness guarantee, for the uniqueness of these two solutions. And again, what I'm looking at is these initial conditions, whether these are in the interior of the region where the function is continuous. <clears throat> My first point here, 1, 1, is in the interior of the region where this first partial derivative is continuous. And so I'm guaranteed that a solution exists and is unique. So that means there is one solution going through that point. 
For this second one though, I'm guaranteed that a solution exists, but if you look at this point here, one, zero, that is on the boundary of a region where this function is continuous. That is not in the interior of the region where that function is continuous. So for this second one, I am guaranteed that a solution exists, but I am not necessarily guaranteed that it is unique, which means there may be more than one. So I, I am guaranteed that a solution exists, but I am not guaranteed uniqueness meaning there could be more than one solution that passes through this initial condition. So this is theorem one, which is a more complicated theorem to use. There are two different things to check. First of all, where the function is continuous and then where the partial derivative is continuous. The second one, theorem two that we talked about for linear differential equations is much more straightforward to use. So let's go ahead and talk about that for this example here. For the linear differential equations, you're gonna to wanna to write that differential equation in standard form. So you're gonna to wanna to write dy dt. And I'm gonna subtract this ty term over to the left side and also divide through by t squared minus four. So I'll have minus t over t squared minus four times y equals zero. So I put my linear differential equation in standard form. And the theorem that we talked about for linear differential equations guaranteeing existence and uniqueness, you really get both conclusions, existence and uniqueness, from checking really one condition. You need to check the P of T function, so that would be the coefficient function for the Y. And the Q of T function, so that is the function on the other side of the equation when you've written that in standard form and you need to check where those functions are continuous. And so these are only functions of t, so you don't have two variables to think about, just a single variable to think about, so you can think about intervals or perhaps a number line. Um, so the only trouble I have with continuity is here for p of t at t equals negative two and t equals positive two. So these are both continuous on the intervals negative infinity to negative two, negative two to two, and two to infinity. And then what I wanna think about is where the initial condition lies. And so for this first one, my first initial condition here, y of five equals two, I need to pay attention to the input variable here. These are t values here, so I need to pay attention to the t value here. t equals five is here that is in the interior of that interval where that function is continuous. So for this initial condition, I am guaranteed that I have a unique solution. A solution exists and it is unique. And furthermore, the theorem about linear differential equations gives you something that the theorem about nonlinear differential equations or the more general theorem does not give you. This gives you an interval on which you're guaranteed that that solution will not fall apart. The solution will be defined on this entire interval, on at least that interval. This is interval of t values for my solution. All right, so I'm guaranteed a unique solution exists and it will exist at least on this interval where t is greater than two. The second initial condition, however, y of negative two equals one, that is not a point that is not in the interior of any interval where these p of t and q of t functions are continuous. So for this second initial condition here, I am not guaranteed that a solution exists at all, and so it doesn't even make sense to talk about uniqueness if you're not even guaranteed that a solution exists. So for this one, because negative two is not in the interior of an interval where this P of T and Q of T functions are continuous, there is no guarantee of any solution, unique or not. 
And um, that doesn't mean that a solution definitely does not exist. It just means that there may not be a solution to this differential equation that passes through this initial condition, this point. Um, so the other thing I mentioned here was that theorem two, the theorem about linear differential equations, gives you these intervals. If you are guaranteed that you have a solution and it's unique, you get an interval on which it's guaranteed to exist. One of the sort of disadvantages of the other theorem that we talked about, theorem one, for nonlinear differential equations, is that even if you're guaranteed that you have a solution and that it is unique, you're not guaranteed any interval on which that exists except just some small little neighborhood around your point that you're interested in here. So I am guaranteed a solution exists and it is unique, but only near the point one one. So if we talk about near a formal definition, we might be talking about an epsilon neighborhood around that point one one. And for this second one here, I'm guaranteed a solution exists near the point one zero through and near the point one zero, but it may fall apart very, very close to that point. The solution may actually fall apart. Um, so in a small neighborhood around that point is where that guarantee holds. So that's one of the disadvantages of this theorem. It's a ton more work, a lot more stuff to think about, and you don't have the the quality of the interval that you get. So remember that the theorem that I used here, theorem one, really applies to both of these. But if you have a linear differential equation, you want to use that theorem two for linear differential equations because one, it's easier to check, and two, you get this guarantee of an entire interval, hopefully, on which your solution will exist. All right, and so we didn't actually solve either of these differential equations, but that's a handy thing to know before you jump in to solve them, whether you expect there to even be a solution to the differential equation or not. Practice some more of these. This is an important idea. Students often struggle with these, but make sure you just continue to practice it. We will continue bringing it up, and eventually you will all get it, I am sure. <laughs>